Number three, Steve O'Shaughnessy. Tisdale is a small town in the Canadian Prairie Province of Saskatchewan. Tisdale is home to the world's largest honeybee statue and Canada's biggest 7-Eleven convenience store. In 2015, it was home to about 3,000 people. 27-year-old Natasha Gosling and her partner, 23-year-old Steve O'Shaughnessy, lived in a trailer park in the town. Their six-month-old daughter, Natasha, has three children from her previous marriage, 8-year-old Jenica, 7-year-old Landon, and 4-year-old Janaya, were also living with them. The children were often busy with swimming lessons, martial arts, gymnastics, and modeling. Latasha and O'Shaughnessy, who worked as an oil rigger and was an avid hunter, had been together for about three years. Looking at Latasha and O'Shaughnessy's social media accounts, it seemed like they had the idyllic family life. For a while, Latasha's children called O'Shaughnessy, Dad. But then their biological father, Jason Gosling, started to visit them more often, so they stopped calling O'Shaughnessy Dad. But people close to Latasha knew not everything was as great as it appeared on their social media accounts. O'Shaughnessy was controlling and had problems with jealousy. He particularly did not like Latasha's estranged husband, Jason Gosling. He was worried that Latasha was going to leave him and go back to be with Jason. On April 20th, 2015, Latasha broke out things with O'Shaughnessy. She found out that he had been having an affair with a co-worker. She told her friend that she and the kids were going to stay in the trailer for a while as she figured out where she was going to move. April 23rd, 2015 was Jason Gosling's birthday. The day before his birthday, he got a disturbing text message with a picture. He quickly realized that the picture was of the dead bodies of his three children, 18-year-old Janika, 7-year-old Landon, and 4-year-old Janaya. He immediately called the police. It turned out that another family member had called the police because they had not been able to get a hold of Latasha. The police went to the trailer park where they lived and they got a key to their home from the manager. Inside the home, they found the dead bodies of 27-year-old Latasha and her three children. O'Shaughnessy and the six-month-old daughter he had with Latasha were missing. They tracked O'Shaughnessy to a home about 80 miles west of Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. When they went into the home, they discovered that 23-year-old Steve O'Shaughnessy was dead by his own hand. His six-month-old daughter was unharmed. O'Shaughnessy's family said that he did not have a history of violence, but he had been dealing with mental health problems. The police never released details about the causes of death for anyone, and they don't plan on ever releasing that information. People were deeply disturbed that O'Shaughnessy sent pictures of the dead children to their father, Jason Gosling, a day before his birthday. Jason's family said that they were sent to Jason whom O'Shaughnessy perceived as his rival for Latasha and her children's affection as a birthday present. Number 2. Billy Ray White In March 1985, 53-year-old James David Hall Sr., who went by J.D., lived in Douglasville, Georgia. J.D. had been married to his wife, Barbara, for 36 years. They met when J.D. was 17 and Barbara was 16. They only dated for two months before they got married. They had two sons and a daughter. JD was a hardworking man. He opened his first grocery store in 1968. He later rented it out and opened a second grocery store with a gas station. Unfortunately, the first grocery store burned down. He planned on rebuilding it, but in March 1985, he was busy with other projects. He was not only running his grocery store, but he also ran a road grading business with his sons. He planned to build a car wash and dry cleaning business across the road from his grocery store. If that was not enough, he was also building a new house. At 4.30 a.m. on March 29, 1985, he opened the grocery store. He worked until Barbara arrived to relieve him. He then went to work on his new house. 
17 hours after opening the store, he returned to it and closed it down for the day. He then went home and went to bed. Just before 4 a.m. the next day, he awoke to start his day. As he was getting ready, he heard someone start a dump truck he used for his road grading business. He realized that someone was stealing the dump truck. He told his wife he was going out to investigate. She called the sheriff and one of their sons. JD confronted the thief and he was shot under his left eye with a 44 caliber revolver. The shooter then got into his truck and tried to drive away. But by then, the sheriff and JD's son had arrived. The sheriff ordered the driver out of the truck. It was a young teenager. JD's son asked where JD was. The young man said he had shot him. By the time they got to 53-year-old JD Hall, he was dead. The boy was identified as 13-year-old Billy Ray White. White was born in April 1971 in Irvinus, Florida. He was the youngest of three children. The family lived in a rundown trailer with no running water or a toilet. Both of his parents were high school dropouts. His father was a violent alcoholic who beat his wife and children. If Billy disobeyed his father, he was beaten with a belt or forced to sleep under the trailer or in a different trailer that was rat infested. Once, his father skinned a possum in the trailer and would clean up the mess. He also refused to let anyone else clean it up. Another time, his father shot several hunting dogs and made his children drag their bodies into a sewer hole. Both of White's parents clearly favored his older brother. His father would do things like promise to take White fishing, but then take his brother instead. White's mother attempted to take her own life twice in front of her children. In 1980, White's parents divorced and White went to live with his father. His father was not around often, so White often ate out cans. His father also refused to do laundry, so White would wear the same dirty clothes for weeks. Without stability at home, White started sleeping in barns and even dog houses. White was bigger than the other children at school and often bullied them. White's mental health problems emerged at a young age. When he was five, he would hit his head against a tree as hard as he could. When he was seven, he grabbed a knife and threatened to kill himself. At age 11, he was arrested for stealing bicycles and breaking into a grocery store. By that age, he was drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. After several disturbing outbursts at school, he was sent to a camp for troubled boys. He spent 17 months in the camp, then he was sent to live with his mother. He was enrolled in a school for kids with special needs. In October 1984, he was placed in a juvenile detention center after he threatened his mother with a switchblade and assaulted a fellow student. In the facility, about four months before the murder, White told psychologists he could murder someone and not feel regret. A social worker tried to get him into a mental health facility and applied to a dozen of them, but they all refused to take him. All the reports written about him stated he had intense anger issues. Also, the report from the psychologist indicated he was homicidal. Then the caseworker applied to the Anawaki Treatment Center for Emotionally Disturbed Youth in Douglasville, Georgia. White and his mother flew there and White was interviewed. After the interview, White was supposed to return to the juvenile detention center. However, 13-year-old Billy Ray White did not want to go back. So he fled from the parking lot of the treatment center. About 50 hours later, he shot and killed 53-year-old J.D. Hall. He had stolen the revolver from the truck of one of J.D.'s neighbors. In August 1985, White pleaded guilty to murder, armed robbery, and theft of a motor vehicle. He was given two life sentences for the murder and robbery convictions and 10 years for the car theft. In 1989, four years after the murder, J.D. Hall's family received disturbing handwritten letters. In the letter to J.D.'s daughter, 
The writer vowed to, quote, carve her up like a turkey and make her head into a flower pot, unquote. In the letter to his son, which is postmarked May 15, 1989, the author wrote that he was going to, quote, put him through a meat grinder and force his relatives to eat him, unquote. He also wrote, quote, you can run, but you can't hide. You can go to the police, but they can't protect you. You can change your name, address, or even move, but I will always find you. They can't keep me in here for the rest of my life, unquote. The letters were all signed off, Charles Manson. But J.D.'s family knew they were from 18-year-old Billy Ray White. At the time, a person serving a life sentence in Georgia could apply for parole after 14 years. This meant that White was eligible for parole in 1999. J.D. Hall's family campaigned for him to stay locked up. They used the letters as proof that he was too dangerous to be released. One letter written by a family member in part reads, quote, If White were ever to be released, I would be terrified to step foot out of my house. I also believe with every fiber of my being that our community would also be placed in serious danger. Unquote. White admitted to writing the letters and said it was a stupid thing to do. In June 2010, 39-year-old Billy Ray White had his sixth parole hearing. White's sister spoke on his behalf. She talked about his terrible childhood. She also pointed out that he was only 13 when he committed the murder. She argued he should be given a chance to show that he's a changed person. Why was denied parole at that time as well? In May 2016, after serving 31 years in prison, 45-year-old Billy Ray White was released. In the following eight years, he has stayed out of prison. Billy Ray White is 53 years old at the time of this video, and his current whereabouts are unknown. Number 1. Jack Trawick In the autumn of 1992, 21-year-old Stephanie Gash lived in Birmingham, Alabama. She shared an apartment with her mother, Mary Kay Gash. Stephanie was attending college and planned to become a social worker. On October 9, 1992, Mary Kay left for church around 7.30 p.m. When she left, Stephanie was at home. When Mary Kay returned home, she saw her daughter's car parked in the parking lot. Her damaged eyeglasses were found on the ground near her car. Her dress was twisted and in front of the apartment building. Mary Kay went into the apartment and discovered Stephanie wasn't there. There were no signs of a break-in, for a sentry, or a struggle. The next day, the dead body of 21-year-old Stephanie Gash was found in a creek about two and a half miles from her home in the neighboring city of Irondale. She had been sexually assaulted, beaten with a hammer, strangled, and stabbed once in the heart. The police learned that she was seen shortly before disappearing at nearby Mall's food court. The police believed that she was kidnapped after she returned home from the mall. But they had no idea who kidnapped her. Then, on October 26, 1992, just two weeks after Stephanie's murder, 45-year-old Jack Truick was arrested on a parole violation. He lived in Irondale with his mother. He was the suspect in several attempted abductions of women. Truick had a long criminal record dating back to 1970. He was convicted of burglary for breaking into women's homes and stealing their underwear. He was sentenced to a year and a day. In 1980, he was arrested for telephoning women and pretending to be a police officer. He told them that their husbands were injured or killed in car crashes. In October 1981, he pleaded guilty to three counts of impersonating a police officer. At his sentencing hearing, he made an unusual request. Instead of going to prison, he wanted to be castrated or lobotomized. The judge denied the request and sentenced him to two years of prison. He was released in November 1981. A year later, he was convicted on four counts of burglary. Once again, he had been stealing women's underwear. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison 
he served seven. After Trick was arrested for the parole violation in 1992, he was questioned about Stephanie Gash's murder. At first, he refused to talk and asked for a lawyer, so the interview ended. Three days later, he wanted to talk to a homicide detective. He said he had some information about Stephanie's murder. He said he wanted to keep it out of the news as much as possible for his mother's sake. He also said he wanted it to be a capital murder trial and he wanted to be sentenced to death. Later that day, Truick admitted to the murder of Stephanie Gash. He said that he followed her home from the mall. He kidnapped her after she got out of her car. He then took her to an isolated area where he sexually assaulted her and then killed her. But he was not finished confessing. 20 years earlier, in July 1972, 17-year-old Buddy Joe Richards was found stabbed to death in an alley in Birmingham. Betty Joe was from Quinton, Alabama, but had run away from home and had been living in Birmingham for several months. Truick was 25 when he murdered her. The police said that he told them things only the killer would have known. Then, four months before Stephanie was killed, on June 17, 1992, 27-year-old Francis Pruitt, who went by her middle name, Eileen, was doing sex work. Eileen was addicted to drugs. She was on the street in Birmingham looking for a customer. She was later found stabbed to death. Trick said he took her to a wooded area where he raped and murdered her. For the past four months, Eileen's boyfriend had been in jail awaiting trial for her murder. He was released after Truick confessed. Trick was charged with the murders of Stephanie Gash and Eileen Pruitt. The district attorney later planned to charge him with the murder of Betty Jo Richards. Track to Rick went to trial in March 1995 for the murder of Stephanie Gash. He pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or mental defect. The trial lasted three days and then the jury deliberated for an hour and 40 minutes. He was found guilty. Trick wrote a letter to the judge demanding he be sentenced to death or he would murder someone working at the prison. The judge granted him his wish and he was sentenced to death. Trick went to trial for the murder of Eileen Pruitt months later in October 1995. He once again pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or mental defect. He was once again found guilty. He was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Since Truick had been sentenced to death and life without parole, the district attorney chose not to try him for the murder of 17-year-old Betty Jo Richards. In November 2001, while sitting on death row, Jack Truick received a letter from 21-year-old Neil Arthur O'Connor, who lived in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Truick and O'Connor became pen pals. In July 2002, O'Connor wrote about his interaction with Truick on Google Groups. He wrote, quote, I guess you could call me a fan of serial murder and crime in general if you wanted to, but I'm not a fan of Truick's. I often write to men in prison, but I have not once written a fan letter to someone in prison. I wrote Truick because I knew nothing about him other than what I heard on a few websites, that he was a serial killer slash rapist who was proud of his crimes and admits to them. He sounded like someone I wanted to get to know better and after a couple of letters, I knew that assumption was correct. I find the man intelligent, likable, interesting. Hell, he's just an all-around great guy." Unquote. He also wrote, quote, I feel lucky to know Jack, and I consider him a friend, not some sort of sideshow freak who I'm showing off. Unquote. O'Connor also had big plans for Truick, writing, quote, I want to make Jack Truick the international superstar that he deserves to be." Unquote. In September 2004, O'Connor launched a website dedicated to Truick. It included gruesome drawings that Truick did of the women he murdered. O'Connor also posted some of Truick's writings. There were detailed descriptions of the murders. There was also an imaginary conversation with Stephanie Gash. Truick wrote, quote, 
Was it really worth it? It was for me, smiley face. I would do the whole thing again, knowing death row was waiting for me. Watching you die was worth it all, unquote. On one page it read, Trick Philosophy 101, Never rape a woman without killing her. Never kill a woman without raping her. Eventually a rape female will tell someone, unquote. He also gave directions on how to stalk someone and strangle them slowly so that they eventually regain consciousness. On another page titled, Jack gives a female fan rape slash murder advice, Trick wrote, quote, murder is deliciously, deliciously delightful, unquote. In his writings, Trick also claims he committed six other murders. He said his victims were Dr. Virginia Bryan, Michelle Thomas, Susan Hill, a woman he only identified as Kim, and a mother and daughter whom he does not name. The police investigated these claims, but found no records of the murders. In one of Trick's letters, he taunts Stephanie's mother, Mary Kate Gash. He signed off the letter, writing, quote, Love you, the psychotic killer of your useless daughter, unquote. Mary Kate was disturbed and hurt when she found out about the website. Many other people were angry about the site. The creator, Neil O'Connor, had no plans to take it down. He was openly defiant. In response to one comment of someone threatening to shut down the site, O'Connor wrote, quote, Try and stop me. I look forward to it. Unquote. O'Connor argued that the site was protected under free speech, and experts agreed. The site's content was vile, but it wasn't against the law. In January 2004, Mary Kate sued Jack Truick, the Alabama Department of Corrections, the warden of the prison where Truick was incarcerated, and Neil O'Connor for $40 million. The prison's warden talked to Truick, and Truick agreed to stop sending out the graphic letters. The website was eventually taken down. No record can be found regarding the outcome of the lawsuit. Jack Turek was scheduled to be executed on June 11, 2009. He had fried chicken, fries, onion soup, and a roll for his last meal. Just after 6 p.m., Turek was led to the death chamber. When asked if he had a last statement, he said, quote, I wish to apologize to the people whom I have hurt and ask for their forgiveness. I don't deserve it, but I do ask for it, unquote. Then the lethal injection process started. 62-year-old Jack Turek was pronounced dead at 6.17 p.m. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.